All right, thanks for hanging tight with us, folks. Um, yeah, just as a quick agenda, um, in the interest of time, I'll go through this pretty fast. We're just going to introduce the project team and the background and motivation, and then quickly go through a summary of the SERP tech discussion that was given in February of this year by um, Justin Schaller and Charlene Sylvester, and then get into the recent work that the team has been working on which includes refining some of the tools and workflows, as well as diversifying the inlet test sites. And then finally getting into some um, anticipated applications and products. Real quickly, the co-PIs of this project are Charlene Sylvester and Justin Schaller. Um, and the research team includes me, Mateus, Rakia Williams, Ashley Elkins, and Alex Ostoyek. And then thank you to Tanya Beck, the CERT program manager, as well as our PDT advisors. Next slide, please. So quickly, the background and motivation for this project is that districts were expressing need in, to track inlet geomorphic features in order to reduce O&M costs by optimizing dredging and material placement and reduce the need for or optimize modeling efforts. In addition, they wanted to be able to identify sandy material features for potential borrow sites, um, in which case they needed to know the recharge rates of those sites and as inputs to sediment budgets. And they also expressed the desire to have ready-made products and user-friendly tools. Next slide, please. So, I went too far. So, to address the needs presented on the priority, prior slide, um, a use friendly tool was developed. That's the ArcGIS, the Inlet Atlas, and uh, is an open access web based map designed to be an effective search tool for tidal ends across the United States uh, that allow decisions managers to compare and analyze various inlet features, features, and data. And such as we can see, like the Eptal Delta morphology, we can see like here on the image, you can see the, for example, the tidal prisma of the, of the specific inlet, for example, or the East Pass inlet. You can also, as I said before, the volume of the tidal delta, and also you can find some reference for that can reference for for this for those inlets. And this is kind of the summary, uh, brief summary of what was presented. In the last technical discussion in February, presented by Justin and Charlene, as I have mentioned before, which focused on initial testing and establishing workflow for DEM compilation, relative relief mapping, geomorphons, cross-stratigraphy, and conformal mapping, and also testing in place that's rich on data and per, per in print data. For example, the one that the poor, the one that's poor data, that have poor data is the one in Far Island in New York, and the one that have rich data is the one in East Pass in the Gulf in Florida here, the Gulf side of the coast. Um, and and we're gonna be applying those methods in three different inlets. One is on the east side. On the Atlantic side of the of the coast, Barnegat Inlet, and also we're going to apply a new pass inlet on the Gulf side of the coast, and Goose Bay on the Pacific coast, okay, in Oregon State. Here we can see the bathymetry of those inlets, and we can see they they have different size and shape, basically related with the a wave package and tidal package of each side, each side. So. so, one of the workflows that the team has been working on is the compilation of bathymetric data from different sources. Um, so, basically, we're taking National Coastal Mapping Program topo bathymetry LIDAR data and merging that with USACE district collected bathymetric data sourced from eHydro. So, basically, the workflow is you inventory and download the data in the area of interest. Um, extract it and match datums and coordinate systems as necessary, mosaic those data sets together 
grid them to three meters. Um, if there's any voids remaining, you fill them with inverse distance weighted interpolation and then mask out this topographic data. And so this first workflow can be applied before you apply any of the other workflows that we're gonna talk about in this presentation. Next slide, please. Another tool or workflow that we've been working on is the relative relief analysis developed by Wernet et al. in 2016. So it basically calculates the relative difference in elevation of a grid cell to its neighborhood in order to identify geomorphic features in surface data sets. So this relative relief ranges from zero, which is like no relief, to one, which is the maximum local relief in a given neighborhood or window. And so you can repeat this analysis with different neighborhood or window sizes in order to identify different scales of relief. And in that bottom right picture, a would be changing the window size, and that affects your relative relief for, in this case, small, moderate, and large windows. Next slide, please. And so this is an example of the results from some relative relief analysis. In the upper left, you have um, New Pass, Florida bathymetry from 2015. Um, from that, you can calculate zonal statistics, such as the minimum and maximum for each window. In the bottom left figure, that's a 30 meter window. Um, then you can interpolate that to a surface and calculate the fine scale relative relief. Um, in the upper right, that's a 10 meter window looking at fine scale geomorphic features. And in the bottom right, that's the kind of broad scale or 30 meter window where you can um, identify much larger features. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna be talking about geomorphos. That is a tool that's based on an algorithm that combines elevation difference and visibility concepts to classify terrain, landform type. And, class, you, and this tool classify 10 types of landform. We can see here on the top right panel, the type of landforms the flat, the ridge, the shoulder, the foot slope. And using these two, we can kind of find, identifying the area of the epitidal delta. For example, for East Pass, we can see here, like kind of where is the area of the epitidal delta here. And also we can see some shows also. And for Barnegat Inlet, we can see kind of the exact area, the location of the of the epitidal delta. And this slide here shows the difference of applying this tool in different type of hazard that have like one have a high resolution and the one have a low resolution. The, we can see like kind of the one that have a low resolution is kind of noisy compared to the one that have a right higher, uh, the one that have a higher resolution is kind of noisy compared to the one that have a, a low resolution here, that's 10 meter cell size. It's kind of, and so what this says is that kind of using a rather have a higher resolution, a low resolution would be best to kind of get the approximate area of the epitidal delta. And now talking about chronostatigraphy analysis that follows the methodology outlined on Pearson 2022. And this strategy illustrates the delta deposition behavior over space and time. And this is uh, this for for new paths. And we can see like the transect from A to B, A to C, on here on the right side of the of the slide. And here we are using five bathymetry. And we can see from the strategy like where the sediment have been deposited in places of erosion, and also maybe. Yeah, place of erosion. In this here is the arc transect. We can see here where we also it's showing like where the sediment is moving, and we can see here like since like the longshore current is from northwest to southeast, we would expect to see like sediment moving to that direction. So this kind of highlight where the sediment is moving and depositing. And this is the same for Bernagat Inlet. 
But in this case, is a, we can this case we are using bathymetry from 2022 to 2023, and for 2023 we have like two data sets. So it's kind of showing like a short term evolution of the epitope delta, and here from D to D prime from here the arc transect we can see kind of the movement of sediment going toward the north to south, kind of following the the long shore sediment current and for a to b we can see kind of like a deposition of sediment on the edge of the of the tile delta here and this is for goose bay we can see also as i have shown before like the place of deposition and this is for for e from this the arc transect from e to e prime so we see like a lot of deposition on the right side of the inlet compared to the left side here. And we see a infill of the inlet of approximately 40 meters here on the channel, in the middle of the channel. And looking at the transect, let's go to A to B, A to C and A to D, we can see like less deposition, the, the, we can see less deposition of new, less new deposition compared the toward we go to the to the south here where is located the the more rocky coast and maybe this can be related with the orientation also of the of the shoreline and this is a I wrote so a archpy right? it's a archpy code that I wrote that's for you to extract the strategy of the of your unit of interest. Basically, you have to follow this like seven steps here. So the way I kind of created this code is kind of make it easy to to get strategy for the unit that you're you're looking for. Yeah, and so the final tool or workflow that we've been working on is the conformal mapping analysis. Um, I just went too far, sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So uh, just as a reminder for new pass, we have several different bathymetric surfaces, um, 2004, 2006, 2010, 2015, and 2022. And so this conformal mapping analysis is um, a workflow that was developed by Pearson et al. 2022, and his paper and GitHub access to this code is right there at the top of the slide. But basically, this is a workflow in order to identify and track complex geomorphic features and movement through time and space um, for an inlet, which would normally require numerical modeling. Next slide, please. So the first step in the conformal mapping analysis is to calculate the time-weighted mean surface from all of your surveys. And then the second step is to compute the volume anomaly for each survey, which is basically the volume above or below that mean surface you just calculated. And then the third step is to conformally map those results to polar space and reproject them on a rectangular grid. So in figure A, you have the example bathymetry from 2004 in xy or cartesian space in b that bathymetry has been conformally mapped to polar space so instead of x and y on the x-axis you have theta your angle and then on the y-axis you have rho which is the distance from the mouth of the inlet and then in c that is the volume anomaly for 2004 in xy space and d is the volume anomaly for 2004 mapped into polar space. Next slide, please. So the next step in this analysis is to collapse those volume anomalies in each dimension, uh, rho and theta, and that allows you to create a Hovmuller or two-dimensional time series diagram. So on the left side, you have the time series of theta. So you're basically looking at the rotation of features through time. And then on the right side, you have the time series of rho, looking at the migration of features toward or away from your inlet. Um, next slide, please. And so what you can do 
with these results, um, this is still a work in progress. So these are not final results. I just drew these lines on here as an example. But basically, you can do peak and trough finding analysis to track those peaks or troughs through each of these time series. So in the example on the left, I've just kind of drawn this red line on these peaks to track this particular feature. And then you can fit a trend line to that feature and estimate, in this case, the rotation of that feature around your inlet through time in a certain direction. And then on the right side, also track that feature's migration through time. And that trend line is now your estimation of how that feature is migrating toward or away from your inlet mouth through time. Next slide, please. So uh, shifting gears, I'm gonna show, this is a code that I wrote following the step of Beck and Arno to kind of like make the process to kind of process, like calculate the peptide of volume kind of in a, in a fast way, I would say, kind of make it easy for someone that want to compute the peptide delta volume fast. So basically what the method is, you first you have to, to define your area of interest. Then you have to create four transects and two on each side of the of the inlet that's are not and this still section should be not affected by should be not located near the the epitile delta because this transect is gonna be used to create the no inlet bathymetry surface so this will be like a a, a trans polynomial surface like th for example here on the left corner side we can see like example what would be like trend surface poly polynomial trend surface this is like for the first order when it's like flat and it's like for for a second order polynomial surface and this method have been applied to 20 units along the west coast of florida so uh, this is the code that I wrote kind of for like three steps you have to First, define the area of interest. Then you have to uh, put the bachim that your 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 interest to be the bachim of the epitope delta that you want to be extracting the volume. So this is from new class. So we can have like from 2024 and 2020, 2022 to check how the volume has changed. And the third step would be. Uh, uh, putting the coordinates of the initial and the end point of the transects that you want to be create that you want to be using to create the the trans this the surface polynomial surface and so for, to validate what I, my to validate what my code I compare with the result on on init atlas and so the result that I found with the result of the in the inlet atlas and we see the values are quite similar and so i believe this can also become a toolbox to be used in arcgis pro and this is kind of how the method works like we have the bathymetry and we have the polynomial surface so we subtract the bathymetry from the polynomial surface this is the second order polynomial surface then we will get the residual raster. And from the residual raster, we, we just want to use the positive, we, do, we just want to use, we just want some, some, the positive values of this residual raster to estimate the epitope delta volume. But however, there is a limitation that when we subtract the, when we just, since we just use the positive values to compute the epitope delta volume, and this is the rust that represent all the positive values of the of the epitope delta. It's kind of not getting the exact the approximate location of the exact location of the epitope delta. For example, the here the red red line here, we can see like there that we are not interested to be computating, and it's kind of adding this value to the to the to the volume of the epitope delta. And this value would be almost 1.4 million cubics of sediment being added to the delta volume. So to 
avoid this kind of troubleshoot, avoid this problem, this limitation, would be the next step would be coming up with a decision tree that is the, that's defined as a supervised, supervised machine learning algorithm that used to set of rules to make decisions. For example, in the image here on the left side, we can see like the decision should I accept a new job or not. So basically for like a steps to come up to, to come up to decide what's so the idea would be come up with a decision tree that kind of help us get the approximate error of the of the Aptile Delta. And we can also be using some of the tools that we already presented before, such as Geomorpho, the, especially the one that have the uh, a small raster resolution, for example, here on the right side here, to kind of cover, to kind of, so we can use that to see the exact, to collect the, to know the exact error of the Aptile Delta. And from there estimating the, the more precise the more accurate volume of the Aptile Delta. Yeah. So the anticipate products and application and short term, we take a note in review, the one that just submitted, compare methods approach at East Pass and Fire Island and poster presentation that Kate is gonna give at gonna give at ASBPA in August. And long term uh, ORISE fellowship, I uh, I pretend to just like part or pretend to this this opportunity be one part of my chapter dissertation of my PhD, and also become a publication, and uh, add products workflow to US title English authors, uh, and also come up with create some toolbox also and MATLAB code open source be like more accessible yeah. To become uh, convert the MATLAB code to an open source such as Jupyter Notebook, and this is the reference that we have been using that we use it for this presentation. And yeah, that's for all for, for us from our point. Yeah, we'd be happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Yeah.